تعجل بالقرآن من قبل أن يقضى إليك وحيه وقل رب زدني علما ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد So carrying on from the section we were on we had some ayat still remaining in this section The last ayah that we had looked at was the ayah وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْدَادًا يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ That there are those from the people who take alongside Allah or besides Allah partners and they love them as they love Allah but the believers they are greater in their love for Allah so we mentioned regarding this ayah that it highlights how the mushrikun their worship was divided and split between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and their other false deities and the ayah also highlighted that the believers are greater in their love for Allah. The believers are greater in their love for Allah. And this can be either because the believers, their love is pure for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Whereas the mushrikun, their love is divided. Or it could mean that the level of love the mushrikun have for their false deities, no matter how great that might be, the level of love the believers have for Allah is still greater than that. So the believers, their love for Allah is greater. And here perhaps we can mention some of the different types of love. Al-Mahabba wa aqsamu al-Mahabba The different types of love. Al-Awwal Mahabbatullahi subhanahu Firstly, your love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Love for Allah, that you love Allah. وَلَا تَكْفِي وَحْدَهَا بِالنَّجَاتِ مِنَ النَّارِ وَالْفَوْزِ بِالْجَنَّةِ That by itself is not enough to be given salvation from the hellfire and to be entered into paradise. Your love for Allah by itself is not enough. Because even the mushrikun, as the ayah mentions, had some love for Allah. فَإِنَّ الْمُشْرِكِينَ يُحِبُّونَ Allah. Even the mushrikun, they claimed some love for Allah. So the believer has love for Allah, loves Allah. But that is only one aspect. There are more aspects. Athani, al qism athani, mahabbatu ma yuhibbuhu Allah. To love what Allah loves. The second type is that you love what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. وَهَذِهِ الْمَحَبَّةِ هِيَ الَّتِي تُدْخِلُ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ وَتُخْرِجُ مِنَ الْكُفْرِ And this type of love, loving what Allah loves and hating 
what Allah hates. This type of love is what enters a person into Islam and exits from kufr. وَأَحَبُّ النَّاسِ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَقْوَمُهُمْ بِهَذِهِ الْمَحَبَّةِ And the most beloved of the people to Allah are the ones who are greatest in this type of love. That they love all of that which Allah loves. So they love all of the obedience and the worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that is what Allah loves. Al-ibadah ismun jami'un li kulli ma yuhibbuhu Allah wa yaradah. Worship is a comprehensive term for everything that Allah loves and is pleased with. So the greater this love is within a believer, that he loves what Allah loves, loves the obligations and the implementation of them, the wajibat, loves the obedience to Allah, the greater the love a person has for that, then the more beloved he is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third type of love, al-mahabbah fillah, walillah. The third type of love is loving for the sake of Allah. Loving for the sake of Allah. The first type of love was loving Allah. And even the mushrikun claimed that. The second type of love was loving that which... Allah loves and the third type is now loving for the sake of Allah Al-Mahabba Fillah Walillah loving for the sake of Allah Wahiya Fard Kamahabbati Awliya Illah Wabughli A'ida Illah and this is obligatory that you love the awliya of Allah you love the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you hate the enemies of Allah. وَهِيَ مِنْ مُكَمِّلَاتِ مَحَبَّةِ اللَّهِ وَمِنْ لَوَازِمِهَا And this love, loving for the sake of Allah, hating for the sake of Allah, then it is from the type of love that perfects and completes your worship of love. And it is what is necessitated from your love. فَالْمَحَبَّةَ أَتَّامَّةَ مُسْتَلْزِمَةَ لِمُوَافَقَةِ الْمَحْبُوبِ فِي مَحْبُوبِهِ وَمَكْرُوهِهِ وَوِلَايَتِهِ وَعَدَاوَتِهِ because the complete love, the absolute love for Allah, it necessitates that you love what Allah loves and that you hate what Allah hates and that you love the awliya of Allah, those who are, as they say in English, the friends of Allah, meaning the obedient and the righteous ones, and you hate the enemies of Allah. ومن المعلوم أن من أحب الله المحبة الواجبة فلا بد من أن يبغض أعداء الله ويحب أولياءه. And it is known that the one who loves Allah سبحانه وتعالى the obligatory love what is required of you then by default it is necessitated and it is required and it occurs that you will then hate the enemies of Allah. How can you love Allah and love what Allah loves and yet not hate the enemies of Allah who uh, go against the commandments of Allah and disobey Allah? The fourth type. المحبة مع الله المحبة مع الله 
loving alongside Allah. Loving alongside Allah. Al-Mahabba al-Shirkiya wa hiya al-Mustalzima lil-Khawf wa al-Ta'zim wa al-Ijlal fahadihi la tasluh illa lillahi subhanah. ومتى أحب العبد بها غير الله فقد أشرك شرك الأكبر. So the love whereby it necessitates from you having a fear and it necessitates from you that reverence and awe of Allah سبحانه وتعالى. A recognition of the might and the majesty of the one you love. If that is what is necessitated by your love, if you give that love to others besides Allah, so you love alongside Allah others with that love, then you have committed shirk. That is then shirk, loving alongside Allah and having that a feeling of greatness and awe and reverence and submission and fear of others alongside Allah, then that is shirk. Al-Khamis, the fifth type. Al-Mahabba al-Tabi'iyya. Natural love. The fifth type is natural love. وَهِيَ مَيْلُ الْإِنسَانِ إِلَى مَا يُلَائِمُ طَبْعَهُ And that is when a person is naturally inclined to something that he likes. He is naturally inclined to something that is favorable with him and it's something which he likes. كَمَا حَبَّةِ الْمَالِ like the natural love that mankind has for wealth. It's a natural feeling of love that a mankind, that the uh, people, mankind have to wealth, to money. It's a natural love and a natural feeling a person has and mankind generally have. Well, well it, and a natural love to have children and to have numerous children, then a person desires that, desires to have children, numerous children. These are the types of things that mankind instinctively have that natural love for these things, for wealth, for children. And that's why these kinds of affairs are mentioned in the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about these affairs of wealth and of children because they are natural within a person that a person is inclined towards those kinds of things. فَهَذِهِ الْمَحَبَّةِ لَا تُذَمْ The natural inclination to those kinds of affairs, it is not dispraiseworthy. That is a natural inclination a person has towards wealth and towards children. It's a natural love that you may have. So in of itself, it's not this praiseworthy unless illa in ashgalat an ta'atillah unless it preoccupies a person away from the worship of Allah. If it preoccupies a person away from the worship of Allah, then it becomes dispraiseworthy. So a person's natural inclination to wealth, he works, he is paid, given his salary, and he feels happy when he sees that money comes into his account, a natural inclination to that wealth, no problem. But if it now overwhelms him, this desire for the wealth 
and he begins to be preoccupied with it, chasing after the worldly affairs, chasing after the wealth, now it becomes dispraiseworthy. And within this fifth category of al-mahabba, al-tabi'iyyah, is also what the scholars mention, the natural love that a person has to other people, especially, in particular, specifically, in regards to a person, for example, who is Muslim, but his family are maybe not Muslim. His parents are maybe not Muslim. So that revert, can he love his parents? And his parents are mushrikun. His parents are mushrikun. Kuffar. Can he, the revert, love his parents? No. no? He cannot love them. His parents, they ring him, they say, how are you, my son, how's everything? I love you. He says, I don't love you. Bye. Is he going to say that? It is allowed in one aspect. Which one? The last category was the natural love. Your parents, you're going to have natural love. They're your parents, even if they're kuffar. Even if they're mushrikun, the natural love you're going to have. But when you said no for the other categories, you're right. You cannot have love for them to the extent that you're going to prioritize them over the religion, over the obligations, over what the messenger commanded. If you do that, then that's incorrect and false. That's not allowed. Your parents are non-Muslims and they say to you, don't pray. If you obey them now, but my parents and this and that, and you don't pray, permissible or not? Haram, impermissible, you cannot love them like that and obey them like that. But this natural love, they are your parents, even if they are kuffar, they are mushrikun, you have the natural inclination to your parents, brothers, sisters, who may not be Muslims, they have not accepted Islam, you are going to have a natural love and a natural inclination for your brothers and sisters, your parents, your mother, your father. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. The natural love that you have in that way. You could even give the example of a man and his wife who is Jew or Christian. She's Jewish, she's Christian, yet she's his wife. So there is the natural love between them but over and above that it's different so the scholars they say you are not going to obey your parents who are mushrikun for example in anything that overrides the religion or the commandments of the religion or what the prophet commanded us with but you obey them in all else your parents are mushrikun they tell you to do the chores in the house obey them They are uh, non-Muslims, but they tell you to go out and do the chores and do the shopping and go fix the car. You do it. Obey your parents. Those affairs, are they going against the Sharia in any way? They tell you, go wash the car, son. Not at all. Go and do it. Obey your parents. So you have the goodness to them in all affairs, except if it is going to conflict with the Sharia. If it's going to conflict with the Sharia, then you cannot obey them. They say to you, you have to miss your prayer because we need you to do something. You say, okay, I'll do it, but I have to pray. You need to give me 10 minutes, I must pray. Obligation upon me from Allah. Then I'll continue with this job and everything else. So the natural love is okay. And I remember a time, I think I mentioned this once before. We were with Sheikh Ubaid al-Jabari and somebody asked him a question or he was narrating that somebody had asked him a question where a student who was a revert and his mother was not a Muslim. So the student, he said, sometimes my mother rings me. He was a student at the university, one of the students at the university. He said, my mother back home, she rings me sometimes or I ring her and we talk and she's not Muslim. And at the end of the call, you know, the normal kind of 
way people talk at the end of the call, she says, I love you, my son. He said, am I allowed to say to her back, I love you too, mother? Can I say that at the end of the call, I love you too, bye? Can I say that phrase to my mother who's a non-Muslim? She's a kafir, a mushrika. The sheikh said, of course, you can say that to her. Because your intention in saying that is your natural love. She's your mother. That's a natural love as long as it does not go into the realms of conflicting with your implementation and practice of the religion. Your natural love for your mother is not an issue. You can say to her, I love you. You love her, the natural love. So these are the different categories that were mentioned there regarding the types of love. So now then we come to the fifth ayah. وَقُلِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي لَمْ يَتَّخِذْ وَلَدًا وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ شَرِيكٌ فِي الْمُلْكِ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ وَلِيٌّ مِّنَ الذُّلِّ وَكَبِّرْهُ تَكْبِيرًا So here then. وَقُلِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي لَمْ يَتَّخِذْ وَلَدًا وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ شَرِيكٌ فِي الْمُلْكِ Say all praise is to Allah, the one who did not take a son and nor does he have any partner in this dominion. Neither did he take a son nor does he have any partner in this dominion. So if you break it down section by section, in that opening section, Allah says, قُلْ Many ayat in the Quran, Allah says, Qul, and then the ayah carries on. Qul, huwa Allahu ahad. Qul, ya ayyuhal kafirun. Qul, a'udhu bi rabbi nas. Qul. When the qul is said, say, who is being addressed? Who is being addressed? Say, Qul, huwa Allahu ahad. Say, he is Allah the one. Who is being addressed initially? The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Qul, say. Ya'ani, qul ya Rasulullah. Qul ya Muhammad. Say, O Messenger. Say, O Muhammad. And this is one of the evidences the scholars of tafsir they use against the mushrikun and the likes who claimed that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wrote the Qur'an himself they say if the prophet wrote the quran himself why is he telling himself to say say why is he talking to himself and saying say muhammad and then the ayah why is he talking to himself they say this is not a suitable uh, 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 etiquette or eloquence in the arabic language to do it like that so this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressing the messenger in these ayat. And that does not mean that the ayat are specific to the messenger. But Allah was addressing the messenger in them. And then they are general to all of the ummah thereafter. So, قُلْ الْخِطَابِ Here is for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَإِنْ نَعْمْ قُلْ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ Say that all praise, every type of praise, جميع المحامد لله are for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what is the reason? One of the reasons here Allah tells us now الَّذِي لَمْ يَتَّخِذْ وَلَدَا The one who did not take any offspring, did not take a child. Did not take a son. Remember in this section we were talking about the negative or negation of affairs from Allah. Negating affairs from Allah. Because by negating certain affairs from Allah, it then affirms the opposite and perfection even more. So here it's another negation. Allah did not take any offspring. هَذَا مِنَ الصِّفَاتِ السَّلْبِيَّةِ لَمْ يَتَّخِذْ وَلَدَا لِكَمَالْ صِفَاتِهِ وَكَمَالْ غِنَاهُ عَنْ غَيْرِهِ 
So the fact that Allah did not take any offspring is therefore uh, an affirmation of the perfection of Allah and the complete lack of requirement to anyone else. Allah has no need for anyone else. He did not take a child, indicates the perfection of Allah and that he is completely upon power and might and majesty and has no need for anyone else, no need for offspring. Whereas us as mankind, it is for our benefit as we grow old that we have our offspring, we have our sons who are strong, we have our families, that is for our good. That is something that is desirable. A person becomes old and he has his strong sons by his side. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from his perfection does not require anyone or anything. And because obviously there is no comparable, no comparison or resemblance or equal to Allah. فَلَوْ اتَّخَذَ وَلَدًا لَكَانَ الْوَلَدُ مِثْلَهُ And if Allah had taken a child, had taken a son, then that son would be similar to Allah. He is the son of Allah then. And then you would have some type of resemblance and some type of comparable and some type of equal to Allah. He is the son of Allah then. And we know, as we've done already, there are no equals, no comparisons, no resemblances to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَلَوْ اتَّخَذَ وَلَدًا لَكَانَ الْوَلَدُ مِثْلَهُ لَوْ كَانَ لَهُ وَلَدْ لَكَانَ مُحْتَاجًا إِلَى الْوَلَدْ يُسَاعِدُهُ وَيْعِينُهُ لَوْ كَانَ لَهُ وَلَدْ لَكَانَ نَاقِصًا لِأَنَّهُ إِذَا شَابَهَهُ if Allah had offspring, that would be considered a deficiency in Allah. That would be a deficiency. Because then there would be a comparable or there would be some offspring to aid Allah, to support Allah as the offspring does. This would indicate a deficiency to Allah. And Allah has no deficiencies, no shortcomings whatsoever. And so it is not correct to attribute a child or a son to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whatsoever. We already covered, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Say that He is Allah the One. One and unique and none other. Ahad indicates one when there is no second to it. When you say wahidun, then you can have after it a thani, wa thalith, wa rabi'ah. But when you say ahad, there is no thani, wa thalith, wa rabi'ah. In the Arabic language, ahad is one by itself. Wahid, then you can have the second and the third and the fourth, a rabi'ah, a khamis, a sadis. But with ahad, the Arabic language indicates that one by itself. There are no other numbers to go with it. Ahad is Ahad, one, that's it. So, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَد Say he is Allah the one. No comparable, no son, no offspring. And when the ayah says, لَمْ يَتَّخِذْ وَلَدًا He did not take a son, but it means a child. It includes a daughter. He did not take a daughter. He did not take a son. Because as we know, the different mushrikun, the different people, they claimed different things against Allah. There were those from the Jews and the Christians, they claimed that Allah has a son. So the Yahud, Al-Yahud, qalu lillahi walad, wa huwa Uzair. They said Allah has a son, Uzair. وقال النصارى لله ولد وهو المسيح and the Christians they said Allah has a son and that is عيسى عليه السلام والمشركون قالوا لله ولد that Allah has offspring and they meant by it الملائكة and they claimed that the ملائكة were the the angels were the 
daughters of Allah. They claimed that the angels are the daughters of Allah. So whether it is the sons or the daughters, all of that is rebuked in this ayah. فَقَوْلُهُ وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ شَرِيكٌ فِي الْمُلْكِ This is an addition to what's been mentioned there, that Allah does not have any offspring and He does not have any equal or partner in His kingdom. He does not have any partner or equal in His kingdom. وَالَّذِي لَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ شَرِيكٌ فِي الْمُلْكِ لا في الخلق ولا في الملك ولا في التدبير. So Allah is the one who does not have any partner in creation, in His dominion, in His control of the creation. There is no partner alongside Allah. كل ما سوى الله فهو مخلوق مملوك له. Everything besides Allah, then it is creation. And all of that creation is under the control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَلَمْ يُشَارِكْهُ أَحَدٌ فِي ذَلِكَ So nobody can participate alongside Allah in that. Allah mentioned in the Qur'an, قُلِ دْعُوا الَّذِينَ زَعَمْتُمْ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ Call upon those whom you have claimed besides Allah. لا يملكون مثقال ذرة في السماوات ولا في الأرض. They do not control even مثقال ذرة. It is a point to indicate the minimal amount. That's why in the translation they say that uh, they do not control even an atom's weight, meaning even the smallest amount. That's the purpose of this example. مثقال ذرة. Like the uh, sweet corn, tiniest amount. So now they say atom, tiniest amount. That they do not even control an atom's weight from the heavens nor in the earth. These others that you call upon besides Allah. فَالْآلِهَةَ هَذِهِ لَا تَمْلِكُ مِنَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ شَيْئًا مُعِيَّنًا وَلَيْسَتْ شَرِيكَ لِلَّهِ So these other so-called deities, the false gods that the people make partners alongside Allah, they do not control anything in the heavens or the earth. وَلَيْسَتْ شَرِيكَ لِلَّهِ وَلَا مُعِينَ وَلَا شَافِعَةِ And they are not partners alongside Allah, nor are they helpers to Allah, nor are they interceders with Allah. وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ شَرِيكٌ فِي الْمُلْكِ Then also, وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ وَلِيٌّ مِّنَ الذُّلْ لَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ وَلِي لَكِنَّهُ قَيَّدَهُ وَقَيَّدَ بِقَوْلِهِ مِنَ الذُّلْ مِنْ هُنَا لِلتَّعْلِيلِ لِأَنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى لَهُ أَوْلِيَاءِ على إن أولياء الله لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون الذين آمنوا وكانوا يتقون وقال تعالى في الحديث القدس من عاد لي وليا فقد آذنته بالحرب لكن الولي المنفي هو الولي من الذل لأن الله تعالى له العزة جميعا فلا يلحقه الذل يوجه من بوجه من الوجوه لكمال عزته so then he mentions that Allah does not have any wali from any type of requirement or deficiency. Allah has awliya. As they say in English sometimes, the friends of Allah, the righteous and the pious. Allah has awliya. But not because Allah is in need of the awliya. Not that Allah is in need of them and in need of the righteous people and in need of the pious people to help. Not because of that. Allah does not have any wali in that regard. There is no wali of Allah in the regard that Allah is in need of these pious people to help him and support him. That Allah is in need of these righteous ones. Not at all. Rather the awliya of Allah are the awliya of Allah without Allah having any need for them. And that's why it's mentioned in the other hadith, if all of the people 
they were upon the most pious heart of an individual, it would not increase the kingdom of Allah whatsoever. And then, وَكَبِّرْهُ تَكْبِيرًا And, كَبِّرْهُ تَكْبِيرًا Meaning, the statement as we say, Allahu Akbar, indicating your recognition of the greatness of Allah. يَعْنِي كَبِّرِ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ تَكْبِيرًا بِلِسَانِكَ وَجَنَانِكَ اعْتَقِدْ فِي قَلْبِكَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ أَكْبَرْ مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَأَنَّ لَهُ الْكِبْرِيَاءِ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَكَذَلِكَ بِلِسَانِكَ تَكَبِّرْهُ تَقُولْ اللَّهُ أَكْبَرْ So upon your tongue, say Allahu Akbar. And that is one of the greatest forms of dhikr. One of the greatest forms of dhikr is to say Allahu Akbar. Along with, what are the four statements that are from the greatest forms of dhikr? Allahu Akbar and also Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar. Those four statements are mentioned in many a hadith about the virtue of the dhikr with those statements. So Allahu Akbar is from amongst them. وَكَانَ مِنْ هَدِيِ النَّبِيِّ صلى الله عليه وسلم وأصحابه أنهم يكبرون كل ما عالوا It's mentioned that it was from the practice of the uh, from the guidance of the Prophet ﷺ and the practice of the companions that when they would be traveling and they would go up some elevated place, up a hill or some high place, then on the high places they would do the takbir of Allah. Allahu Akbar as they went high up the hill or some high area. And that is because, as Shaykh al mentions, لِأَنَّ الْإِنسَانِ إِذَا عَلَى When a person goes high up, you are climbing up a, a, a mountain. You are climbing up a hill, up a mountain, up Everest as they go now. Climb up Mount Everest, 20, 30,000 feet, whatever it is. They climb up to the top and they tell you this is the top of the world. Highest point in the world. When a person climbs like that on top of a mountain somewhere, then you feel like you are now in the highest place. You are the highest one. You feel that you're on the top and you see everything below you. You feel that high position in of yourself. So then when they would climb up and the person starts to maybe feel that they are elevated above all the others down there, then you remember, still, no matter where you are, you are still low compared to your Creator. And you remind yourself by saying, Allahu Akbar. Remind yourself by saying, Allahu Akbar. Even when you are right at the top of that hill or mountain, feeling elevated. But you remember, that elevation is nothing. Allah, your Creator, is the highest. And the greatest. And so you remind yourself that you say Allahu Akbar. فالإنسان إذا على في مكانه قد يشعر في قلبه أنه مستعل على غيره فيقول الله أكبر من أجل أن يخفف تلك العليا التي شعر بها حين على وارتفع. That's what we just mentioned. وكانوا إذا هبطوا قالوا سبحان الله. And when they would be descending down, coming down from the hill, descending downwards, then they would say, Subhanallah. A, nuzul suful. Because when you're coming down, then that is lowliness. You are now coming position. فَيَقُولْ سُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ اَيْ أُنَزِّهُهُ عَنِ السُّفُولِ أَلَّذِي أَنَا الْآن فِيهِ you are now coming down and down and down and you are getting lower and lower and lower to the down low end. But you say subhanallah to remind yourself that even though you are now down in the low, coming lower and lower and down and down, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
is free of any lowliness, free of any deficiency or shortcoming. And so you say, Subhanallah, meaning that Allah is, as they say, glorified, meaning that He is free of any deficiencies, free of any shortcomings. So even though you are now coming into some deficiency, low down in the ground, but you say, Subhanallah, to remind yourself that Allah is free of any deficiency or shortcoming. So what do we benefit here? وَالَّذِي نَسْتَفِيدُهُ مِنَ النَّاحِيَةِ الْمَسْلَكِيَّةِ فِي هَذِهِ الْآيَةِ أَنَّ الْإِنسَانِ يَشْعُرُ بِكَمَالِ غِنَ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ عَنْ كُلِّ أَحَدٍ وَانْفِرَادِهِ بِالْمُلْكِ وَتَمَامْ عِزَّتِهِ وَسُلْطَانِهِ وَحِينَئِذٍ يعظم الله سبحانه وتعالى بما يستحق أن يعظم به بقدر استطاعته. So a person is supposed to recognize the greatness of Allah and that Allah is the mighty and majestic over all others and all else and that Allah is one and alone in his control of all of the universe and all of the creation, and is in perfection with his might and power and honor. And then when you think about those things, the greatness of Allah is, is understood by you. You then understand the greatness of Allah and what Allah deserves in terms of that greatness from you. So that is what a person is supposed to think about. When coming across ayat of this nature, then we'll briefly just mention the next one too. يُسَبِّحُ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ لَهُ الْمُلْكُ وَلَهُ الْحَمْدُ وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ We'll just finish off on this one. It says that everything in the heavens and in the earth, they do the tasbih of Allah. And to him belongs the dominion and to him is all praise and he is all capable upon everything. So it mentions that everything in the heavens and the earth, they do the tasbih of Allah. And the tasbih of Allah, it is something physically that is done upon the tongues. A person does the tasbih physically upon his tongue. Subhanallah. You say, Subhanallah. Physically you are doing that tasbih upon your tongue. But also, all of the inanimate objects, it is mentioned about the inanimate objects, the stones, the rocks, the trees, they also... Do the tasbih of Allah, but we do not understand that. وَإِن مِّن شَيْءٍ إِلَّا يُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِهِ And there is not a thing except that it does the tasbih and the praises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then, this ayah, is an affirmation again of the perfection of Allah. To Him belongs all of the dominion, all of the kingdom. To Him is all of the praise. And He is all capable upon everything. This ayah, is it talking about anything salbi, negation, or is it an affirmation? This one is, those in the heavens and the earth do the tasbih of Allah. The kingdom all belongs to him. The praise belongs to him. He is all capable of everything. That's an affirmation. There's no negation here. So here it is an affirmation of the uh, affirmed uh, attributes and the affirmed affairs regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we'll stop on that one. And then we have ayah number seven and ayah number eight. And number nine and number ten, four more, and those four will finish them next time.